Right, let's get started on this uh, on this journey ahead of us. Um, and uh, I just want to just briefly dwell on on why we're doing this. So uh, this is this is very definitely a, a story of the emissions reduction for the whole of the UK, and it's inspired by the UK Climate Change Act. Now Scotland has its own Climate Change Act, slightly different basis for um, assessing progress. In the UK Climate Change Act, we have the long term goal, which is net zero, um, uh, reset last year to net zero on our advice. We also have these things, the carbon budgets, which um, uh, take us every five years on the glide path to that long term goal. This is the this is inspired by the need for us to give advice on the sixth carbon budget. So the act lays out that the uh, climate change committee should provide that advice. And then it's down to the Westminster government to consider whether they can accept our recommendations at some point over the next year. Uh, and, and legislate for a sixth carbon budget. They have to legislate for the sixth carbon budget from 2033-37. Um, they are not obliged to take our advice, but I very much, of course, hope that they will. So let's um, let's begin then, and uh, let's just talk about uh, what we are telling you about today. So last year was a big moment for us. We did this re report on net zero uh, emissions. Uh, and net zero for the UK. What we're trying to describe then was how the UK would look in 2050. Uh, that was the report that also recommended that Scotland should hit a net zero target for 2045. Um, and uh, we tried to paint a picture of what, what life would look like having reached net zero. This is about the journey to that. So it's, a, it's I, I think it's actually a much more interesting thing to think about the, uh, the steps and the changes that will get us to that outcome. So that's what we're trying to do today in this report. And um, to do that, we've uh, we've 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 explored the the, the changes in, in in several different ways. This is the the luxury, I suppose, of having had that report last year is that we can now build on it, try and explain a bit more the different ways that we can approach the challenge of getting to net zero emissions. So we've done that with these exploratory scenarios. You've got widespread engagement there in green. That's a scenario where people um, are more willing to respond to the challenge of decarbonisation. They're more willing to change their consumption of those high carbon goods, switch to low carbon goods businesses as well. Widespread innovation is fast, that really fascinating uh, uh, scenario where we're looking at the, um, the, the, the a world where people are more willing to accept uh, technological change. Technology itself is cheaper. Um, we've also got quite a cheap power price in that scenario. Uh, headwinds is similar to what we said last year. You don't get those benefits from behaviour change quite so much and, and innovation quite so much. So you're, you're looking more to infrastructure, uh, kind of quite centrally planned world with lots of carbon capture in that world. That's that's the three exploratory scenarios. We're not saying any one of them is the right scenario, just that they are three ways that can get to net zero and they all do get to net zero for the whole of the UK. And we can also build a, a fourth uh, scenario, which i um, really excited to have this. This is something that the committee were really keen to explore, which is what happens if you get if you get all of that? What happens if you get all the infrastructure, all of the behavior change, all of the innovation, if everything goes really well? Uh, we call that tailwinds because, of course, there's a favorable uh, journey at, uh, behind us, a kind of tail, a, a, a strong wind blowing us towards that net zero goal. So because of all that, we get to net zero early, so in early 2040s for that target uh, overall. Um, and um, we'll come on to what that implies for Scotland uh, at the end. But really exciting to have it. What we'll talk about most is the, uh, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, is the balance pathway. So that's the, that's the pathway for UK emissions, uh, where we're trying to make decisions in uh, each of the sectoral challenges that we face in cutting emissions that we regard as balanced. Uh, so the committee have really explored those things, come to a conclusion about what we think of as a, a you know, a sensible, uh, feasible set of changes that can play out uh, over uh, the next 20 to 30 years. Um, the crucial thing about this pathway is that it's, 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 uh, it, it, it drives progress as quickly as possible through the 2020s. And then it opens up, it tries to keep open the options for the other exploratory scenarios that we've just talked about. Um, and, and that's the goal here is that over time, you're not trying to close down any of those options that we've described in the illustrative scenarios overall. This is the one that we use to make our recommendations. Uh, this is the uh, pathway that which I'll show you in just a second we've used to uh, describe the sixth carbon budget period. Uh, you'll see how that fits on the chart. It's also uh, the basis for the recommendation we made to the Prime Minister um, just last week on the 2030 NDC, so the target for 2030 for UK emissions. And uh, happily, the Prime Minister has already agreed that target. So um, we're kind of halfway there to 
a strong endorsement from uh, the Prime Minister for this work. Okay, let's get on to the good stuff and to talk about what we are recommending. Again, this is for the whole of the UK. Um, we are uh, in this chart, you can see, I hope, the, uh, the kind of central set of recommendations that we've got uh, for the UK. Uh, you can see the sixth carbon budget period in orange there, again, 2033 to 37. Um, what I hope you can see is the is the is this sort of S shaped curve to the purple line on that chart. That's our balanced pathway, and that S shaped curve tells a story about what needs to happen over the next thirty years. The the early part of this transition, uh, we're not making as much progress as we might like to on cutting emissions, and that's because we're making up for lost ground. So all those areas where we haven't been decarbonising as quickly as, as as we might like, things like transport, uh, heating, decarbonisation, uh, industry as well. We're scaling up our policies to try and address that, but you don't get the emissions return initially. Um, you, um, you then get over the 2030s, the investments that drive the emissions down start kind of flowing through the economy and you see this kind of sharper fall in emissions. And then after the, after the period of 2037 and onwards, we, we tail off again and we get to the, the final part of net zero as we run out of the low hanging fruit. Um, the big headline here is that in 2035, the implication of our recommendation uh, on that pathway is that the UK needs to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 78%. So those of you with long memories will know that just last year, that was the target for uh, cutting emissions by 2050 for the UK, same target that was in Scotland as well as a percentage. So that has been brought forward by 15 years. So very, very uh, strong statement of ambition. That's the implication of net zero. Um, the path is front loaded. So we're doing 60% of the emissions reduction in the first 15 years and 40% in the next 15 years. That's true in Scotland as well. So we've got 60% uh, in the next 15 years of the Scottish emissions reduction on, on, on the Scottish pathway. Uh, all of that's very important. That idea of going early is important uh, because of, uh, in particular, three things. So the, the economic recovery, which can rest, we think, in large part on the kind of investments that will drive us to net zero. Uh, we're also opening up those options that I talked about earlier. If we don't act early, we don't open up the options later for new industries, for new jobs, uh, also crucially for further emissions reduction if we want to do that. Um, and crucially, and I think this is crucial, what we're doing is minimising uh, the cumulative contribution that the UK is making to the problem of climate change itself. So you know that the accumulation of CO2 in our atmosphere, the accumulation of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is the essential issue with climate change. We should be minimising how much we put up there as much as possible. So we've, we've really front loaded the emissions reduction for that reason. And um, this just shows you, uh, uh, you know, why that's important. So uh, this chart is looking at uh, the global goal. This is global. Uh, to meet the Paris Agreement and the temperature goals that are in that, that agreement that was signed five years ago. So... All of you on this call, I'm sure, will know that the, the Paris Agreement talks about well below two degrees centigrade of warming with best efforts for one and a half. Well, these are the two lines that would deliver that. Um, and what you can see is that this is the historical position in black per head of the population. This is global. And it's basically been flatlining per head of the population. So emissions per head. This is tons of carbon, to, carbon dioxide. Um, and what we need to do is get onto the red line which is the line for well below two, and preferably the green line, which is the one and a half degree line. And if I just overlay on top of that the UK story, I think you see something really interesting there. So you, you, we've more or less halved our, our per capita emissions from where they stood in 1990 to the point where they're actually more or less at the global average now. And then what the implication of what we're recommending is, is that we, we reduce those, emission, those, those per capita emissions as quickly as we can, and we actually hit the one and a half degree line and then cross over it uh, at 2035. So we think that's very ambitious and we crucially, we think that's a Paris aligned proposal. Uh, so it's, that's a big part of what we've recommended overall for the UK. Now for the UK, I'm, I'm going I'm to talk about a set of things that matter uh, in the UK wide and of course in Scotland as well. And this is one of the, uh, one of the key charts that we've brought you uh, in our new publication today. This is one, a new take, I suppose, on what needs, needs to happen to get to net zero. Um, uh, my colleague Mike this morning described this memorably as the rainbow chart. So uh, we don't have unicorns this year, and we, this year we've got, we've got, but we do have rainbows for you. So we've got um, uh, we've got four different steps here to abate carbon uh, to get to the goal of net zero. The top one is the challenge of 
uh, becoming more energy efficient, reducing our demand for high carbon activities. Uh, you see that by 2050, it's a relatively small part of the overall mix of abatement, but early on, it's massive. So it's a really important thing to deliver ongoing emissions reduction, especially as you're scaling up all that policy that we talked about earlier. Um, the next section is, um, is, is, uh, is, is, is the uh, take up of low carbon solutions. Uh, the big wedge here is electrification. So this is us electrifying the British economy, uh, electrifying the Scottish economy. The red bit is hydrogen, using hydrogen as a, a, a low carbon uh, vector uh, and fuel. And uh, we've got a bit of CO2 capture happening there too, particularly in industry. Electrification is the big dominant theme here because then we, we, more and more we think electrification is the, is the best route to decarbonisation because it carries with it the ability to use all those green electrons we've been producing increasingly from offshore wind. Um, and the devices themselves tend to be much more energy efficient. So this is the story of, of, of transport decarbonisation, also heat decarbonisation, using all of that uh, through the economy. The blue bit there you see there is expansion of low carbon energy. That's, that's, the, that's the remaining emissions reduction from our power sector. And the green bit is the bit that should remind us all this is not just an energy story. This is also what, about what we do with land. So storing natural carbon storage and then increasingly using that uh, as part of engineered greenhouse gas removal in, in combination with, um, with carbon capture and storage. So let's move on then to the next chart, which is uh, one that will be familiar to you from last year's report if you followed it. This is looking at the role of behavioural change and technological change. 40% um, of the about of emissions reductions to 2035, we think, are, tech, are pure technology. So... Uh, you could think about closing a power plant, uh, doing something uh, kind of without anyone really having to engage. Uh, people in the country don't tend to notice these sorts of changes. That's been the story of emissions reduction so far in Scotland and the UK over the last 20, 30 years in the main. But interestingly, the rest of it, more than half, uh, involves some element of behaviour change. So there's a clue here that this is resting now on a combination of technological improvement and behaviour change. And I suppose the other part of this is unless we start talking about that properly, that's going to be a difficult thing to pull off. So the big message there for policymakers. Now this is, I think, I mean, I'm biased, but I think this is the, uh, the most exciting and uh, optimistic bit of our report. So we worked really hard on the question of costs uh, in this report. And because we have that pathway now all the way to 2050, because we have five different scenarios for delivering it, because we've really looked at the steps that would be necessary to deliver that carbon abatement, genuinely, literally thousands of options for carbon abatement that we've been tracking and plotting. Um, what we can do is something we haven't been able to do before, which is to show you the profile of investment that delivers that kind of goal. And it is mainly an investment story. And the headline here is that we need to scale up the amount of capex that's happening in the UK economy by about, by about 50 billion by 2030, um, and then keep it at that level over the, over the remaining years. That reveals something a bit more than just net zero, which is this bit, and that's the exciting bit for me, which is that it buys you net zero, but it also buys you this big cost savings. This is the uh, story of us not spending on fossil fuels. Really exciting, because you can see that that cost saving builds up progressively over the years, and eventually it cancels out the investment cost. And I think the other thing you can talk about here is that given the extent of investment, there is an economic impact. That is GDP moving. That amount of investment, 50 billion a year is about an eighth more than the investment we did last year. So that, you know, that's a, a clue that this is, a, this is a prospectus for investment across the whole economy. If that investment is done as you come out of a pandemic, rather than, rather than it being a drag on the economy, this is a boon to the economy. This is us... Uh, using that spare capacity in the right way and actually growing GDP. So big, big, important message in this about, yes, the cost overall will be low because of this net impact I'm talking about, but also the net impact is more likely to be positive if we, um, if we front load it again. And uh, this is just another take on that. Now, what we do when we make these cost assessments is that we roll them up into that net position I've just talked about, and we can express that as a portion of GDP, and that's the resource cost as we, as we think about that. Uh, last year, we talked about a resource cost of between 1% to 2% uh, for achieving net zero in 2050. This year, we can show you what that looks like over time. Uh, and you can see that here. It, it doesn't get, in the central case, above 1% at all. So really great news um, that we've got a, a low overall cost, less than 1% 
as a proportion of GDP throughout the next 30 years. That is mainly because we've got cheaper and cheaper power. So just a few months after we published our report last year, we got um, the latest outcome of the latest uh, offshore wind auction. If you plug that in, you get this big cost reduction across the economy, as you'd expect. And that will continue if those cost reductions continue to fall. Um, crucial thing here is that the central estimate is more like half a percent of GDP. Um, and every reason to believe it's, it's, it's not going to cost at all when you wrap into the wider, wider benefits of the economic recovery that I talked about, also the wider health benefits that, that go with that. So that's extremely exciting. It does, though, mask another challenge, which I am not, I'm not showing you in this chart, which is that there's a need to distribute costs evenly. So for some sectors, uh, there is more cost. Think about the challenge of decarbonizing heating, for example, uh, or decarbonizing industry. Uh, you can you could look at those as as real costs uh, against areas where we now see savings, like the trust surface transport transition. So we think it's cheaper now to decarbonize surface transport than to continue to use fossil fuel transport. So that challenge of spreading it is one that we are we are definitely raising with uh, with ministers. That yes, the overall cost is low, but you've got to distribute it fairly. Okay. I'm not going to go through this in the same detail that I did in the uh, the uh, the uh, launch this morning, but just to say, if you're interested in this, what we've tried to work at uh, was a description of the changes that we see along the path for UK emissions over the coming years. Um, I'll, I'll show you the animation all the same. So it tells, a, I think, a really important story of what's what's going on here. You, hopefully, you can see some of the metrics on the right hand side about what's changing as we roll along that path. So. We start in 2019, pre-pandemic, uh, just over 40% reduction in our emissions from 1990 levels. The pandemic is going to make a big impact in 2020, but we're not assuming that those impacts last forever. So we return to trend. In some areas, we assume a slightly longer return to trend, like aviation and shipping, for example. But essentially, we're being prudent about how we're approaching the COVID impacts, not assuming that we get some lasting uh, benefit. And I want to come back to that later in our Scottish advice. Um, so that's 2020. We roll forward to 2025, and you can already see that we're starting to make some, some progress here. So we're, we have to already now move out of discussing single issue uh, progress, like the discussion of the power sector progress we've been, we've been making over the last few years. And we have to be talking about progress across the economy. That's, the, that's a big challenge. So I know we've been saying this for a long time, but this is, this is now a challenge that is genuinely cross-sectoral, genuinely system-wide those changes happening in concert to deliver emissions reduction. Um, you've got all sorts of things now happening across the economy to start that process of really dramatic emissions reduction. Uh, what you're not seeing so far is the payback yet in the, in the sharp fall in emissions. And that's what I was referring to earlier, that they need to scale up. The, the mid 2020s is, is, a, is, is a period of a scaling up the policies that will then eventually deliver those investments that I talked about to get us to net zero. Scaling up our offshore wind, of course, scaling up uh, the installation of low carbon heating, scaling up all the infrastructure we'll need for electric vehicles, scaling up to carbon capture and hydrogen production. Uh, we've got the first carbon capture and storage industrial clusters opening by 2025 in our assessment. So let's move on then to 2030. And now we're really going. So emissions have reduced by nearly two thirds from 1990 at this point. Uh, the NDC that we recommend for 2030 was 68% by 2030, 68% reduction from 1990 as the 2030 NDC and the Prime Minister accepted that advice. Uh, that was expressed without international aviation and shipping emissions, which is the UN rulebook. Uh, if, you, if you add them in, it's a 64%, so that's the same target. Um, this is the key point in this transition. Really keen to land this with you. By 2030, uh, all new investments, all purchases are by and large zero carbon. So all the cars on the road, all new purchases of cars, all new purchases of vans, new heating installations thereabouts, uh, at new plant and machinery, they, they are zero carbon around 2030. So just think about the challenge of getting to that point. That's the policy challenge that's before ministers today, ministers in Westminster and, and ministers in, in Holyrood as well. You are across the UK hitting some pretty remarkable metrics here. So a million heat pump installations a year by 2030. Um, we've got uh, 11 million insulation measures being fitted each year into British houses. Uh, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind installed in UK waters. Uh, by this point, we've got five uh, industrial clusters doing CCS. So we've got some serious CO2 capture happening. Uh, I would expect that, th that Scotland will have at least one of them. At least I hope that's the case. 
Um, we're seeing a falling consumption of meat. By 2030, we've cut our consumption of meat by a fifth. Uh, and that's then allowing more land to be freed up to do uh, natural carbon sequestration. So 2035 now, we're nearly, uh, uh, we're, 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 we're really motoring at this point, kind of maximum, maximum momentum, uh, almost 80% reduction in emissions by 2035. Uh, that was the 2050 target, as I mentioned earlier. And you can see what's driving all that progress uh, on the right. This is a critical year because this is the year that we're predicting that we will have cleaned up the electricity supply. So we're going to stop using uh, unabated natural gas to generate electricity at this point. So that's a big, big moment. Um, uh, and uh, we've also uh, got to the point where natural gas boilers uh, have uh, sales have ended. So 2033 is the date that we think that uh, we need to end the sales of natural gas boilers. After that point, uh, it will be important to sell boilers that are only that uh, if they are ready for a hydrogen conversion later. Um, so that's that's a kind of big, big, big milestone here, only 15 years away, and um, we don't really have the policies in place to deliver that yet. Uh, we've got lots of change happening in industry, lots of hydrogen production, uh, lots of rollout of CCS. And I'll just roll on to 2050, and just briefly to say that by the time we get to 2050, we're now we're matching any residual emissions, especially from aviation and agriculture, with uh, greenhouse gas removals. Uh, there's been a bit of further diet change, and uh, basically it's been normalised by this point. We've got a kind of point where where, where zero carbon is just is just the norm. Uh, it, we've, we've that's a genuinely uh, zero carbon society. I think that's entirely possible. And what we'd said in our report, which goes into a huge amount of detail, is that you can do it. But it's it's really difficult. So you know we've got to we've got to really put in place the the, the policies to to deliver that over the next five years. I'm going to make it that that close. Otherwise, we're not going to be on track for that UK goal of 2050 and the Scottish goal of 2045. Um, uh, I just wanted to give you a sense then of why this is a a golden age uh, for policy making. If you're interested in it, this is just what's being committed by the governments around the UK in the next year. And I, actually, I think we could probably made a longer list. A huge number of things now being committed. And these have really got to deliver. We only get one go at getting this right. So those of you who are in the community who are paying attention to this, uh, I think our political, uh, our political masses need to hear this, that they, they, this is the opportunity before us, getting this right so that that transition plays out properly over the next 10, 15 years. OK, now let's talk more about, uh, about Scotland. Um, and uh, just to say that we have written to Rosanna Cunningham uh, in a letter that you can find on our website. And uh, I'm going to be taking you through that in the last five minutes. So um, I, I wanted to start with um, a, a Scottish version of the investment chart that I spoke about earlier. So the Scottish version is very similar uh, in proportion uh, to the UK version of the investment challenge. And, and there are similarly proportionate savings that go with that. So we're talking about Scottish capital investment uh, increasing by five to six billion pounds per year by 2030, and then being maintained at that level to deliver the uh, to deliver the net zero goal. You can see how that's made up sector by sector. Uh, the big yellow chunk there is the challenge of investing in our electricity supply in Scotland. Uh, the green bit there is the uh, land use sinks, uh, of which Scotland has many. Uh, the purple bit is surface transport. And surface transport is a really interesting one because that's where a lot of the big savings are. So that's the capex requirement to deliver the Scottish target. Um, if we move on, I wanted to just talk about inventory uh, changes and uh, the methodology changes beneath uh, this work. Uh, we know that there are a set of revisions coming uh, to the Scottish uh, Inventory of Emissions UK as well. Uh, they're going to be approved by an expert panel which advises the UK government over the coming years. I'm afraid I don't know when that will happen, but that panel will discuss these changes. There's two that really matter. So um, peatlands, which in Scotland is, of course, a very big deal, accounting for all emissions from peatland in Scotland, we think could add between six and 10 megatons uh, to the latest uh, Scottish inventory. And that is very, very material. Um, and the second thing that's going on is the change in the science on the global warming impacts of uh, non-CO2 uh, greenhouse gases, especially methane. And if we look at those two things I've shown you on the chart here, um, uh, they do make a big difference on, on the Scottish emissions inventory. Um, we in this work are assuming the high end of both of those things to be prudent. Uh, it's possible that we'll get a low end 
in which case that will make the challenge slightly easier for Scotland. But these are real emissions, so it's, real, it's worth saying that we have to tackle them. So we're assuming, uh, as you'd expect from us, a, a, prudent, uh, a prudent outcome there so that we can make our assessments. The next thing I wanted to talk about is the balanced net zero pathway in Scotland without greenhouse gas removals. So this is without GHD removals. And the really interesting thing here is that we have achieved a wholly zero carbon energy system uh, by mid-century in the UK, in, in Scotland, I beg your pardon, as you would expect. What you can see on this chart is that actually, we, um, if we go out beyond 2045, we're, we're at, the, we're at the, the net zero line without looking at greenhouse gas removals. And that's something that uh, I find really exciting. This is a really decisive shift. I mentioned that 60% of the reduction by 2050 is going to happen in Scotland over the next 15 years. But what you can see, I hope, in this is how much agriculture matters. So it really dominates emissions by mid-century in, in, in Scotland. Uh, just another take on that. And um, we're in 2050 here, uh, not 2045. Uh, and what we're trying to show you here is that all scenarios that we've built this year go beyond what we said in the net zero report last year. Again, this is without uh, greenhouse gas removals. Um, we are excluding them, and I'll show you why in a second, just to demonstrate how much further we get than the further ambition scenario, that, which is the name of the scenario that we, we had last year. What you can see, I hope, in that further ambition chart on the right is that last year uh, we had a lot of removals in there. This is where we get... Uh, without those removals in the five scenarios that I've just talked about in Scotland. And then on to that final question of removals in, the, uh, in Scotland. And the key thing is that we think there is lots and lots of scope for Scotland to do those greenhouse gas removals. Uh, so we've actually found more genuine emission reductions in Scotland. Uh, and those emissions removal, uh, engineered removals especially options, mostly BECs, are still there for Scotland, which makes us more and more confident that the 2045 net zero goal is achievable. So lots of options there. Um, uh, and the range that you can see is between two and 10 megatons of removals by 2045 in our scenarios. Now, that is, uh, of course, very exciting. And uh, it's, delight it's great that we can do that and talk about that. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about just to end is the is the 2030 target in Scotland. and. If uh, any of you have heard me speak before, you'll know that I'm, I've had some thoughts and, and, and concerns about that, that target for some time since it was set by Parliament last year. Uh, it was not set on our advice. So we talked about uh, the, the need to build the kind of pathway that I've just described for you before we give, give advice to uh, Scottish ministers about those interim targets. And the 2030 target was set at 75% reduction. Uh, that is pretty tasty, to put it mildly. So that is a, a pretty ambitious target. Uh, in our assessment of the balanced pathway for the whole of the UK, uh, the 2040 and 2045 targets for Scotland, we think, are in the right place. 2030 looks very challenging. So in, in the assessment that we have made, we are likely uh, on that pathway to fall well short of the legislated 75% target in 2030. Uh, on the basis of the current methodology for the inventory, uh, we think we get to about 71% in 2030. But of course, that methodology is not going to be not going to be in place by 2030. So under those future inventory changes, the balanced pathway that we've been advising for the whole of the UK would fall short of the Scottish 2030 target by somewhere between 7 and 11 percentage points. So quite a significant shortfall. And um, I, I really wanted to highlight that. And, and just to look at that a bit more, this is the five scenarios for Scotland uh, and where they reach uh, by 2030. The black line is the 75% reduction required by law in the Scottish Climate Change Act. And these are the five scenarios that we have built for the whole of the UK and their implication for Scotland. And the headline here is that none of them get to that 75% target. Uh, the tailwind scenario, which is our highly optimistic scenario, which we regard as an extremely challenging scenario, and of course, you'd require a lot of things to happen together and for everything to go well. Well, that still doesn't get to the 75% uh, target. So we're talking about actually a really challenging target, which actually goes beyond the kind of modeling that we have done. And um, I did just want to end by, by talking a bit about why that is and then what we can do about it. So the, the main thing that we've done in our modeling this year is that we tried to work particularly with the concept of replacing capital assets at the end of their 
natural life. So the part of the reason for the trajectory for the emissions reduction across the UK and in Scotland that we are that we are um, uh, advising on this time is that we are what we're trying to do is keep the cost low by replacing capital assets with low carbon versions of the high carbon asset as it comes to the end of its natural life. That keeps the overall cost low and makes it quite a feasible transition overall. It's it's that in the main that's holding us back from achieving that 2030 target. So if we want to go further by 2030. And important to say that 2030 is not some sort of advisory target. It is, it is the law in Scotland. Uh, I'll just end on um, where we've made some, uh, given some advice on the things that we could do uh, to go further by 2030. And I'll start by saying that the, the other thing, thing that's playing out here is the uncertainty of COVID. So COVID might make those near-term reductions slightly easier. We're not, again, predicting that, but that might help. If you want to go beyond that, what we've suggested is that there are just a few options here to think about. And um, we've described them here as recommendations. They're not really recommendations, they're more advice and uh, something we'll re be returning to, to uh, with uh, Scottish ministers over the course of the next few years. First of them is uh, bringing forward um, the uh, adoption of BECs across the UK, so doing that early in Scotland. Um, the early decarbonisation of the Grangemouth industrial cluster we think would also help. Um, we've got the potential at least to accelerate the scrappage of some of those high carbon assets that I talked about. That, of course, carries an additional cost, but then cuts emissions more rapidly. And lastly, uh, on the question of decarbonised heat, uh, we think it could be possible to do an additional uh, push with uh, retrofit, especially of hybrid heat pumps, to cut the, uh, the heat demand for, for Scotland and, uh, and the, uh, the emissions with it. None of those options are, are particularly difficult to conceive of, but they do take us beyond that, that balanced pathway that I talked about earlier. And therefore, they're a challenge to Scottish ministers, I suppose. And that's really the last point for me is to say that this is in the round, a huge challenge, of course, for Westminster, but also for Holyrood. And there, there is no escaping the fact that we need action in both of those administrations to get us to that long-term goal of net zero. And I might add my own take on this is that we need a bit more than just action in those two places. We also need those two places to properly cooperate on the challenges ahead of us. Uh, that energy system challenge for the UK is one which Scotland will benefit from. The Scottish voice needs to be heard in Westminster on how that transition should play out. Similarly, Scotland has a set of unique characteristics that it needs to play to if we're going to get to the 2045 in Scotland, which the 2050 target for the UK, of course, rests on. But all in all, a really optimistic take, I hope, on what could be achieved. And with that, I'm going to go back to Keith. <laughs>